Hey, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. It's Ken Bergen here from Silver Chef. Great to have you at this webinar. This is our biggest one for a, quite a few months, actually. Um, a topic that people are very interested in. And we've got uh, some great guests to look at this question from all different angles too. So um, yeah, settle in, um, put your headphone in or whether you're watching it on your phone or on your PC, your iPad, wherever it is, we've got some great content to share with you today. So uh, I'm gonna go through just a couple of minutes to start with and explain how the webinar is gonna work. Um, one of the important things uh, is to make use of the chat. So if you see, I'm just um, dropping a message in there into the chat and that'll probably open up on your screen. And what I wouldn't mind is hearing from a few people how my sound is. If you can hear me clearly, it's good to get a sound check right at the beginning. So if you could just drop, uh, thank you. Thanks, Nicola, Shane, Haley, excellent. Good one. And um, <clears throat> what I'd also like you to do is if you could just change where it, um, the chat is, change from host and uh, panelists to everyone. See the little blue strip there? And that way, um, and this is where you'll drop all your questions in. Okay, so I'm going to get started just with a little bit of technical stuff and then we'll get into the main content with our guests. <clears throat> so, uh, as I mentioned before, um, on your control panel, you'll see there's a black strip. It might be up the top, might be down the bottom, uh, but there's a little chat button there. That's for questions and chat, any comments, anything you want to ask our guests. Um, take notes because, you know, you hear something clever and then suddenly it just flicks out of your mind and you uh, forget it. So whether you write it on your hand or on your phone or scribble it down, whatever it is. We'll have a survey in a minute. Um, so uh, vote in the poll. Um, set your chat, I mentioned before, and uh, we'll have some links. Uh, we're dropping into the chat as well. We'll have links to the different the websites of the different guests who are here. So click on those uh, as you're going along. Important to read our disclaimer, understand that uh, you know, we're here to give you good advice and good information, and ultimately the responsibility is yours for how that's used. And don't forget to join our social media um, channels. So we'll drop the links into those as well. Um, our Instagram and our Facebook's pretty lively, and we'd uh, be great to connect with you on those as well. Also, don't forget that Silver Chef, we're uh, mainly in the business of financing new equipment, but we have our certified used equipment as well, all fully refurbished and uh, sold with a three month parts and labor guarantee. Um, we'll have a link to that as well, but I put fryers up there because that's, uh, we're gonna talk quite a bit about fryers today. Okay, so introduce our guests to you today, uh, Reno Sakacha from All Aboard Seafood from Perth. I've known yeah. Reno for quite a while. And, um, you know, very successful operator, really has a great feel for what his customers want and what the local area wants. And uh, Reno's been doing e-commerce, I don't know, longer than anyone I know. You know, when you look at the website or his shop, it looks pretty traditional, but he's anything but, um, yeah. Kit Houston from uh, Houston's Barbecue in Melbourne, um, operating for last, is it 18 months, two years now, Kit? Uh, two years now, yeah, yeah. 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 Five years okay. in total, two years uh, from a shop. Yeah, okay. So we're, I've got pictures to show you all of this. Um, Lawrence Bellet here from uh, Red Cat, one of the leading um, point of sale and IT platforms. He's going to give us a great overview of, you know, how the what's happening in the industry with uh, takeaway delivery, et cetera. Um, my colleague, Nikki Smith, who's one of our business development managers at Silver Chef. Uh, she's great at helping me out and uh, also has, you know, talking to, I don't know, hundreds of customers every month. You know, she's yeah. got a real finger on the pulse for what people are ordering, what equipment trends and things like that as well. And uh, that's me down the bottom. My, my, biz, my uh, focus is on, yeah, what customers like and what's happening in the industry. So a few of the pointers that we're going to go through today won't, read them all out but you know we're going to talk about menu and production and equipment um managing the marketing whether it's phone calls or websites or instagram or even flyers they still have a place our friends at uber eats and deliveroo will have comments from uh 
people on those. And uh, that question I like to uh, throw up when I'm talking to operators is, you know, let's have a life and have a business. And both of them have got some interesting insights on that as well. So first up, I'm going to uh, introduce Lawrence Pelletier and ask him to give us a bit of an overview of what's happening around delivery and takeaway. Uh, you're watching this very closely, have been for quite a long time, and uh, it's changing fast. Hey, Lawrence, tell us what, what we should be watching out for. Thanks, Ken. Um, so we deal with, um, for a bit of context, we deal with everybody from smaller groups right up to the big boys at the Schnitzes and Nando's and Grilled and Noodle Box and Boost Juice and on all those. So we see sort of a, um, a really interesting cross section, if you like, of different types of food or different, different types of offers and how those are, are reacting. Um, I'd probably say the biggest, um, probably a couple of the biggest things I've seen is a real shift where people are really leaning in. And this is basically since COVID has kind of kicked in. Um, in the early days, everybody panicked a whole bunch and didn't know what to do. And then I think most of our customers started to really lean into to delivery and the, and the uh, delivery aggregators or the delivery partners. Um, that was probably stage one. Um, and a big part of that was all around how do I work with these guys efficiently? So from a, maybe from a technology perspective, it might be, well, how do I um, manage these different tablets and how do I get it into my kitchen and how do I, so is my system integrated or could it be integrated and all those sorts of things. So there's a lot of technology questions around that. Um, a lot of places probably, had four different screens, <laughs> et cetera. Or, for all that I've seen 20 in one shop, right? Where they'll have, you know, multiple brands and all sorts of crazy. Yeah. So it, that became a real challenge. And the, I think a big part of that was the, um, the realization. And, and if you haven't come to this realization yet, it's good to, good to know, because I've still come across people who, who um, are pressured by the Ubers of the world to keep the same prices in their shop as they do um, on Uber, et cetera. Um, and the reality is, uh, you know, it's, it's come to light, if you like, that a couple of things. One, um, you are free to set whatever prices you like. And two, the consumer is definitely um, far less price sensitive and understanding that if you're going to get stuff delivered, um, that's a great way to, uh, it's, an, it's okay, I should say, to charge a bit extra to, you know, to make up, to make it a profitable business for you. Um, I'm going to ask on that, is there a general guide on how much? Because I've noticed, it was actually one of the questions I wrote down to ask. I've noticed um, I don't have um, all options near me, So, um, but Menulog and Deliveroo, uh, the pricing for one of my restaurants that I order from is very different. So who sets that? Is it the Deliveroo's or is it the, the restaurant? So that's the... Do you want me to answer that, Ken? Is that yeah, 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 please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the that's the restaurant setting that, and you can you can put whatever you like. Like it's it's completely up to you as a as a restaurateur, um, and it comes down to what's an acceptable number that your consumer, your customers are going to like, are, are going to be happy with. One of the reasons I said just be as a bit of awareness, there's been a long standing um, issue amongst all of the different um, aggregators that there was some pressure on the restaurateurs to have the same pricing. Um, and, and I think there's been a little bit of a triple um, C action on that or some discussion. So even though you may hear whis whispers of that, don't don't fall for it. You can actually put whatever price you like. It's up to you to set your prices. Um, and, and it's about understanding what's reasonable to the customer. Um, most of my customers will put around about a 20% roughly um, increase in their prices. Um, but knowing that sometimes they're paying over 30, 35%, you know, that they'll fluctuate that as far up as they can, that's reasonable. Can I just so, ask just Kit, Kit and Reno, what, what's your policy on pricing on the apps I was just about, to Yeah, I was just about to, um, to add to that. In the early days, there were mechanisms in the software that you needed approval to yeah. change your pricing and those and recently those mechanisms have been taken off so you can just change it warns you uh that you know you're going above a 20 percent increase to what it was before and that your customers may not like it but it's definitely not fixed now um i just actually had five weeks off uber eats i turned it off um and i've ran the last five weeks without it and i made uh the 30 percent pretty much straight away week after week after week so um, I've just turned it on, but have just increased my prices the full 30% um, from what they were five weeks ago with the theory that if you want it on Uber Eats, you can pay for the 30%. 
Um, and if you don't, then you're more than welcome to come down to the shop. And I sort of just ran five weeks of not having it turned on and I didn't lose out, you know, I sort of increased. So, um, but hearing that, I'm, I might just make it 20%. I might <laughs> go back before I launch it on the weekend. Um, but yeah, I just thought, stuff it. I'm just going to make, I'm just going to add 30%. I don't care what the price is. If you don't want to buy it, don't buy it. But people are happy to just sit there and pay $40 for a burger. It's ridiculous, but if they're going to do it, you might as well charge $40 for a burger. Mm. It's about, it's about actually being able to, to manage your food costs and manage your business so that you can actually, you know, you got to make money. Like you can't just be mm. doing, mm. doing it to, you know, what increase volume or something. That's a little mm. bit, well, I think long-term that's got some problems. Reno, so, Reno you use same price for the, um, the apps? Or? No, I'm very similar approach to, to Kit. Uh, we actually surcharge 25% flat on top okay. of, yeah, whatever yeah. I'm charging in store. but um, And going back to a comment Nikki made earlier about <clears throat> having different pricing on different platforms, um, yes, a couple of them, we have better deals than what we have, like, say, for example, than as with Uber, um, but we still charge 25%. So the same, it's the same price on all our platforms. Right, the okay. And so I there's a question from Anandi in the chat. One of you guys might like to uh, answer that. We'll, we'll just keep going, Lauren. I'll, I'll just come back to you, Lawrence. Um, very useful on the pricing thing. I'm glad that came up too, because I know, yeah. you know, a year ago, people were a bit kind of terrified about surcharging, weren't they? And that's uh, mm. not so and, much and it's Well, I've actually talked to some customers who've done some really interesting, you know, sense testing where they're like increase the price every, every week for a little while to see where the, where the volume starts to Mm -hmm. drop off, you know, because it's the only way you'll ever know. And 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 you'll be surprised at how inelastic that is. Mm. If you think about it, when you look at sort of some of the bigger guys that have been delivering pizza forever, it's always been cheaper if you pick it up in store as opposed to delivery. So Mm. I, I had an example where we went to a pizza shop and the difference between pickup and delivery, and I think it was Domino's or something like that, it was almost double. Um, But the other thing too is when we first started with Uber, um, you weren't allowed to charge more that, you know, back then. Yeah, they were strict. But you know how we got around it? I hired a copywriter and instead of having a hamburger in store, we put some ridiculous name on it and had real fun with it. A Reno and burger, was it? <laughs> I think we ended up calling it like a Kui Cobba or something like that. Okay. And we went completely, and we had a lot of fun with it. And because it wasn't like for like, yeah. we could chat. We got away with charging a different mm. price even back then. And that so, Lawrence, just just coming back to you, um, what else? Yeah, so we've got, sounds like the, yeah, yeah. the delivery uh, services are being brought, I don't know, under control is the right thing. But one of the, you know, the one hand, the other hand is, you know, people have a lot of challenges with actually getting drivers at peak time sometimes, don't they? Um, yeah, well, there's, there's a, it's, it's interesting. So I, what, I'm, what we're seeing now is a shift to where it's, people have kind of embraced the whole, you know, the, the aggregators as a group, right? And said, okay, that's part of our business. We'll have to do it. Um, but the newer trend, if you like, is people moving to a white label delivery. So there's, there's two companies that really do that well. One is DoorDash Drive. So not DoorDash Marketplace, which is what the consumer would see on their phone, right? Mm-hmm. But DoorDash Drive um, and Uber Direct. So again, not Uber Eats, but Uber Direct. So those have DoorDash Drive has been around for maybe two years now, and, and Uber Direct is only in the last couple of months that they've launched. And what both of those are is fundamentally, um, you can, the, it, it changes the relationship, right? So instead of in the current relationship with, let's just say Uber for the minute, in that current relationship, they're, they're, they would argue they're doing the marketing, they're finding the customer, they're bringing you the customer, saying we want some food, they're picking up the food and they're delivering the food. So they argue that they're performing a large part of that transaction. And I know that we don't all agree with that, but I'm just saying that's their argument, right? Mm-hmm. So in this white label delivery, your job is to get the order, right? So you can put it on your website, you can put it on Google, you can put it in an app, you know, however you want to get that order. You get the order and the customer goes, but I want it delivered. So the best simple example I can give you is if you go onto like the Nando's website and you go, I want Nando's to deliver my food, right? So it's just, it's just a Nando's delivery. Now that delivery is still a white label delivery. So that'll be delivered by either Uber, um, Uber Direct or DoorDash Drive. 
Um, and it just kind of magically comes to the consumer. The consumer, it arrives to the consumer. The only hint that they have is that there is, a, usually there's a link sent out to them where they can watch the little car come towards them on their phone. Mm -hmm. um, and that is actually, you know, it'll say that that's DoorDash or Uber. So they'll know who, who's delivering it. But it's been proven now that the consumer doesn't care who delivers it. No. They just want the food to arrive, right? So that's mm -hmm. not an important part. Now, why this is all important, though, is, is it changes the economics magically and completely, right? So instead of going 30, 30 to 35 percent to your um, delivery aggregator, what this does is it says, OK, now I'm going to pay um, and, I'll, and I'll do a DoorDash drive one really quick for everybody. So I'm going to pay DoorDash drive instead. And if you look at it in some simple maths, if you looked at a hundred dollar order, this is the one I always use because we can all, I hope, visualize a hundred dollar order. I know that's a big order for most people, mm -hmm. right? But it's a simple math. So in, a, in an Uber world or even a DoorDash world, for that $100 order, you'd be paying them 30 to 35 bucks, right? Depending on what your percentage mm -hmm. is to these guys. In a, a DoorDash drive scenario, so where it's, it's a direct order, you got to collect, you got to grab the order, right? So out of, let's say it's web ordering. And let's just say people probably pay on average, including credit card fees, maybe 5% for that order, right? So roughly your, your cost of acquisition is about $5 on this $100 order. And then you got to deliver it. Now, to deliver it with the DoorDash drives and the Uber Directs of the world, it's an individual negotiation and it depends on distance and all sorts of things. But roundabout, roundabout, if I stuck a number in the air, I'd say it's about $11, right? So now I've got, let's just call an $11 delivery fee for this scenario. So now you're up to about $16 for this, this to, to get the order and have it delivered. But the cool bit about that comes into the middle of this is, well, when people go onto Uber or DoorDash and they order, they also pay a delivery fee, right? So now the consumer pays, let's say a $5 delivery fee. Right. So Uber mm -hmm. or DoorDash mm -hmm. are actually earning your 30, 35% plus the delivery fee. So in this scenario, it's my delivery fee because I have you know, I have my own online ordering as the restaurateur, I have my own um, ordering platform. So I'm gonna say to the consumer, yep, um, if you order from me, my delivery fee is five bucks or whatever the number is. So if you remember from the earlier, $5 to acquire the order, um, $11 to deliver it, but then I'm getting five bucks back from my, um, my delivery fee. So now my overall cost of fulfilling that order, getting and fulfilling is around about $11. It could be 10 mm -hmm. to 12, whatever it is, but in that neighborhood, right? You compare that to an Uber or a DoorDash order for 30 to 35 for the same order. So if you can shift your orders away from those aggregators, even though you're still giving them business, but you're just letting them do the delivery bit, mm -hmm. um, we're seeing a huge tre trend towards that. Uh -huh. So, you'll see so it's like, putting putting the strength, putting the onus back on my website or my Instagram activity yes. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing is it's your marketing. So the guys who are doing really well with this are guys like Grilled, guys like Nando's, guys like um, Schnitz, all those, you know, the big brands because people will go to their website or go to their app or, or find them on Google. So, so we, even if you're not, you know, a, a very massive group. Is this right? available for small operator, individual Yeah, even if you have one well? shop, right? Okay. At the smallest version, right? I know that uh, DoorDash, for example, has a, um, a portal available. So you could, as a very small operator, you can have a portal and what you do is you type into the portal, hey, I've got an order. It's got to go to this address. It's ready. It'll be ready in 10 minutes. And that'll actually organize a driver to come and mm -hmm. pick it up and take it on your on your DoorDash account. So you can still do that. Um, so that's that's I know that DoorDash Drive does that. And I think Uber Direct is is working on that. I, I'm not positive whether they have that mm. set up. OK, we've had a that's couple a, of questions there. People service. want to know how do I contact it? I suppose it's through the main websites, is it or through? Um, yeah, yeah, just those, to, just and just a comment on this too. Um, last year we did a webinar, not not the same as this, but I was sort of relay a bit related. And one of our guests, uh, Emma Nguyen, who's got a great um, Vietnamese restaurant, she has her um, Uber and Deliveroo account managers come to visit her every week. Uh, sorry, every month. Yeah, once a month. Yeah. I mean, she's like. She's giving them lots of money. They got to come and talk to her. Now, when I raise this, oftentimes people say, "What." I didn't know there's such a person exists. It sounds like this is how you negotiate the, some of that stuff or, you know, let's find out who they are. Yeah, interesting. I might yes. move you along, Lawrence. Is there any other? Yeah. Um, this is so interesting. You've um, mentioned to me before about Google ordering too. Um, yes, is that yes. still a thing? Is that growing? So or where, where does that fit into the mix? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, Google Learning is pretty cool. If you guys look, everybody can check this one out easy as long as you know how to use Google, right? If you Google on your phone or on your computer, something like food near me or burgers near me or whatever, I, I can tell you, Red Cat customers, we actually integrate directly in. So you'll do, if you do like a grilled near me or Centuro or Schnitz, you'll see them come up in the Google in the Google search and they'll, they'll be a button, sometimes two buttons that'll either say um, order, order to pick up, I think, or... Um, or, the, or basically you can order for pickup or delivery straight out of Google. So what happens is while I'm in Google, I'm a consumer, I'm in Google. So I'm not necessarily a loyal customer of yours, maybe. And I've just Googled, you know, some food or something like dessert or whatever it is. And I can order within the Google page itself. I never leave Google. You go mm -hmm. all the way through and you actually, you pay and everything and off it goes. So either it gets delivered to you or you go and pick it up. Um, that's only available through integrations right now though. So you can't really go on and just set it up yourself or anything. So you have to have a, a tech partner that does it. So that a lot, you'll see that a lot of the online ordering guys will do it. So if you went to like a tab square or one of those guys, they'll actually often have the ability to put you onto Uber, onto Google and that Google page will feed into that online ordering mechanism. Um, so we do it direct, direct into our world, it's, it's the same as those guys would. Mm -hmm. um, but that's worth doing if it's available to you. So to whatever you're using, it, that's a, we're, we're seeing like in terms of volumes, um, we're seeing reasonable volume, not crazy. You're not going to like, um, you're not going to celebrate and have a, you know, a massive Christmas party over it. But it, it's kind there's a couple of things. One is it's, it's not free. Free is the wrong word. Google's not charging, by the way, for the minute. So it is kind of free in that sense. Um, but it is bonus in a lot of ways it's bonus business because mm. you're getting customers mm -hmm. in the door who may not have known about you so it's, it's a good way for people to discover you it's probably the right way um lawrence just like to kind of wrap up your part yeah. with just talking about you've got paperless kitchens there um you talk we talked about going from 20 screens or five screens down to one screen what, what do you see about the logistics in the kitchen you know of like the yeah the order comes in so hard and how quickly it can get out and how businesses are streamlining that and making that more yep. effective. So the challenge you've got, and, and we've all done this, is especially, you know, it's like playing whack-a-mole, right? Where you start to have multiple screens and they're going off and you're trying to figure out which one has the order on it. Especially anybody doing virtual brands and things, it starts to become more and more screens. So what we've done, um, we've done a bunch of work to integrate all the orders directly. They come in off of the, whichever, any of the, the major four systems, they'll come in come straight off the screen, automatically go out into the kitchen, go through the pause. So they're there for reporting and everything straight into the kitchen. And then what starts to happen is the screens become, they're still there, but you're not having to accept orders and stuff. You're actually using them to manage an order. So you're really only gonna go use that screen if you need to tell a driver something like call them early or say there's a problem with that particular, maybe tell somebody there's a problem with that particular order, that sort of stuff. So it becomes a communication tool or an order management tool mm -hmm. rather than, order acceptance and you're not having to type orders in because the, the key depending on how complex your menu is like so how complex the things are that people are ordering <sighs> the retyping of every order can kill you right that is a lot yeah. of effort and it's prone to error lots of errors you, <laughs> you, yeah and so you, you have lots of problems and even yeah. reporting later is painful right so you want it's very difficult to keep it with any volume keep typing those in all the time nice. okay well look thanks for your kind of um helicopter view i think that you've no, got no some worries. great insights and um there's a few questions yeah you might like to just jump on the chat as well i think probably I'll, yeah, speak I'll, to I'll you and any now. any more questions um for lawrence or anyone else just drop them into the chat that's what it's there for but we're going to swap over now to talk to kit houston about houston's barbecue in melbourne um yes, there he is looking very serious with uh the meat i'm always out serious of, out of the smoker serious business <laughs> meat is serious business yeah okay and we'll drop the uh kit's uh, website into your chat as well um so let's talk menu to start with kit when i first saw it i thought where's the rest of it um it's very small it's very focused um there's a reason you're a very thoughtful guy <laughs> what tell us about the menu how you designed it and just you better give us a bit of background to how you started the business too a couple of years ago. Yeah, no worries. So Houston's Barbecue started about five years ago as a um, one day a week pop up uh, smoked meats, American smoked meats um, business. We'd pop up at breweries and, and so on. 
two years ago, two and a half years ago, I took a trip to America to make sure my food was on track. And I went to Texas and visited um, around 30 joints in one week. And I uh, asked questions, learned a bit and made sure that my food was okay. And then when we came back to Australia, I opened up a small little um, joint, barbecue joint, where at the end of a, of a dead end in an industrial estate, it's an old smoko shop where you traditionally go and get your potato cakes and your dim sims and stuff, um, you know, for a quick, a quick snack on your way out. Uh, exceptionally cheap rent, a couple of hundred dollars a week, um, low, absolute low overheads, everything else. And we opened two days a week, which was uh, Friday and Saturday. So we only opened for 14 hours a week. Um, and during that time, we sell in excess of uh, 350 kilos of meat. And we do hundreds and hundreds of meals out the door from when we open until uh, when we close. So that's the real quick, that's a real quick um, mm -hmm. um, overview of what we do. So my menu and why is it so small? Because uh, I don't do much well or um, exceptionally well. So I just focus on the few things that I do exceptionally well. Um, we use as many, if, we, if it doesn't work, if something doesn't um, sell, if, something, if something's beyond my um, skill set, um, we just get it off the menu as quick as possible. Um, and we just use uh, what we can in as many different meals and products as possible um, to keep the menu small, uh, keep it within my wheelhouse and um, keep it moving out the door. Um, you know, when you've got 40 uh, takeaway meals sitting on a bench going through our pretty much our production line, um, I can't, I, me and my staff sort of can't uh, think too much about what goes into it. They just, you know, paint by numbers. We build by, build boxes by numbers. We need to just go one, two, three, four, and then out the door as quick as possible. Um, so, of course, we do American smoked meats. Uh, you'll see shortly uh, my big smoke. I think we've got a photo uh... Where and that it? burger, yeah, so there that, it is. that burger it's... on the side, uh, no uh -huh. one back, no nope, two back. That one, yep, okay, tell us about the burger. Oh yeah, sorry, so yeah, that burger on the side, we, um, I had, I do, on Thursdays, we had preparation for the Friday and the Saturday, um, and I had basically all my labour costs on that day, uh, so we decided to open up for Thursday just to cover the labour costs, so we do these burgers one day a week, um, my entire business is um, built on fear of missing out. So we only do a hundred of these burgers. Um, and if you don't pre-order, you don't get one. Um, and we've pretty much sold out five weeks in a row every Thursday for a hundred. We block out two hours in the afternoon, which is the time that my staff do bulk of their preparation for Friday and Saturday, because we're a barbecue business, we're not a burger business. Um, and it's just a different way of looking for things I needed. I had labor costs that I weren't covering and now I cover them. Um, so with the focus then still falls on the Friday and the Saturday. Mm, interesting way to uh, look at labour costs, which is a stress point for, for everyone. And in a minute, we're going to look at uh, some of your marketing too. So let's just have a look at, uh, here's your front of house. Looks like it's yeah. uh, nice and simple. Yeah, it is. It is. It's really simple. So um, I've tried all of the devices and, and I, it was Lawrence um, uh, Uber, I, I agree with before it. Uber is an, is an amazing tool. Uh, if I was to pay a, an IT company to develop an app, to distribute it into the hands of tens of thousands of people and then to convince them to use it to purchase my food, I'd be out millions. And to pay 30% for that, the largest marketing company in the world, um, I think it's fair. I think it's fair. I think it's worth 30%. They manage the people, they manage the software, they manage everything else. I don't think, I think they still make a lot of money, don't get me wrong. Um, but... We, uh, if you don't put your prices up, um, if you're not, um, if you're not, yeah, if you're not staying on top of it, you can, you can, volume is not good when you're only making 5% or 3%. I don't care mm -hmm. how much you're, you're selling. If you're not making good money on everything, then just don't use it. So, so as you'll see there in the, in the bottom there, we just use, we've got Square, um, which we use the free version. Um, I'm pretty tight when it comes to spending money on stuff. So I just use the free version of Square. Uh, you'll see that little Uber tablet there. Um, we just had it turned off for the last five weeks and, and we made the about 28% um, increase week after week. So having Uber on or off for us is no biggie. Uh, saying that, we're going to turn it back on again this why, week. Why did you turn it back on? 
Uh, j- just as another avenue, like I just okay. I didn't want to. So we've increased ours to 30%. Um, and then after talking to uh, Lawrence and Reno, I'll probably bring it down to like 20, 25. Um, mm-hmm. So, but I just thought, look, if, if I turn it on and somebody buys a $20 hamburger that they can get for $15 in store, um, then I might as well take their 20 bucks. Like, yeah. Okay. Um, people want convenience. People, they spend, you know, like one of my meals, uh, with the 30% on it is $110 or something. So if people mm-hmm. want to spend that and not drive down here, um, yep. then I can't stop them anyway. So yeah, look, just to have a quick run through this. So from Square there, our ticket prints, uh, sorry, can just go back one? Yep, quick? yep. So our ticket prints over there on the left, on, over the B on the barbecue. And then basically there's all of our packaging on the left there. Uh, it starts that process there, goes down that center table. Uh, cut hot meats which we do in front of everybody like an old school 80s carvery Uh, they get cut and then moved to the center and then all the fried goods on the back wall they get moved to the center and they all come in and then when they reach the end of this table here I'm just above uh, Jess's head there um, they then get put in the warmer on the right hand side there and all of our meals sit hot in that warmer in their bags ready for the customers Uh, we do almost 30 percent pre-ordered and paid for before we even open so rather than walk uh, through walk walk ins yeah yeah so Mm -hmm. so almost 100 kilos of meat is sold we start selling from sunday for the weekend Uh, monday tuesday more sales wednesday thursday more sales and then friday starts and we can have up to 50 or 60 prepaid orders in our system for each day Um, so we just basically tickets automatically print out telling us Customers coming in in 15, we fulfill the order, have it waiting on that right-hand side there in one of those large warmers. They walk in, they've paid, contactless almost, hand them the bag and, and out the door they go. They're in and out of our shop in, in a minute if it's ready, two minutes if it's not. Okay. Do you have um, procedures in place to ensure that uh, the same volumes going out so customers are getting the same week after week but it also cost control for you? Uh, yes. So in the front there next to the meat on the left-hand side is a weighing machine. So all of our meats are cut like a deli. So we put exactly Let's have one a look at one of the uh, portion samples here. Oh, it's making me hungry. Uh, we also do <laughs> extremely, extremely large, I think, portions or whatever. So, so, yeah, so, so what, the what's br- the cost of that combination there? Is that a combo that's, or is that a special that's photo? A com- that's, a, that's a family platter, uh, which is there's 200 grams of brisket, uh, 200 grams of pulled pork, two 100 gram sausages, two chicken wings. The bread and the slaw with all of our meals is very sort of uh, traditional Texas, and that's just complimentary. We add that in for free. Uh, you got a reasonable portion of fries there and then two two burgers there for the kids uh so that is from memory i I actually don't know i I don't spend much time in the shop anymore um i think it's around i think it's around sort of 70 odd bucks yeah about 70 bucks or so um that's just shy that'd be a kilo of meat on there uh plus fries slaw and bread so in a box it's yeah it's a pretty big seller and on your um on your shelves in your shop that's is that a spice rub you sell or something yeah so so when covid when covid hit we just kept pivoting. We didn't stop. Um, if I make it in here, I sell it on those racks. So that's our brisket rub, our pork rub, our salt and pepper for steak rub. The tall white one in the center there, that's salt. I resell the salt that I use. Okay. Um, my customers. <laughs> Magic salt, it. is it? <laughs> it's, it's, so and hopefully none of my customers are on here. No, I'm joking. Uh, so it's, it's um, so kosher, kosher salt is non iodized or iodine salt. Okay. In Australia, we don't know that. So I take sea salt and I put it in a bag and I sell it for five bucks. So uh, pepper, the mustard that we use, I sell the drinks that I get in from Costco. I put 30% on those and people buy it in that fridge. That's all the cold cuts. Um, On the left-hand side is all the raw. So it's the briskets that I use. It's the pork ribs that I use. It's the pork shoulders that I use. I put 30% or anywhere from 20 to 30% on those. They come in with my supplier. I fill that fridge. People come in, they grab a hot meal. They then grab raw meat. They then grab the mustard to to bind it. They then grab a dry rub. They then grab a box of soft drinks. And then on the right-hand side is... Um, my heat and serve meals, um, which is uh, stuff that I haven't sold that night. We cryovac it up into its, its beautiful portions. Um, and then we have that in the fridge. And then just next to that fridge is a freezer. So once 
it has finished its life in the fridge. We then freeze it and we go full price, 10% discount, 20% discount, and then every quarter we empty the freezer at a further discount. Okay, um, just to interesting. Make, yeah. Now I'll have to keep it's moving here because yeah, I want to talk to you about your marketing. Now I understand Instagram is your number one. You've got yep. a shop on Facebook, which is interesting yep. to see. Um, you, we can order through Instagram. Tell us which one's more popular. What's your activity on both? How do you make yep. them work? Yep. If I could get rid of Facebook, I would straight away. Facebook is a forced to be connected to Instagram. So Instagram connects to your Facebook profile. You then get your shop uh, going backwards and forwards. Um, and then I get it on both. Uh, we link and um, you'll see some of those photos have the little shop icon on it on the, on the copy of the, of the Instagram page. So people will click on um, our Instagram photo. So I'll put a new burger up. People will click it. They'll buy it there. They then go through to Square. Square then buys, uh, pays for it all online. And then they pick the time they want to pick up and the day they want to pick up. And then it's ready when they walk in. Mm -hmm. uh, so Instagram's our number one, um, our number one form of, of advertising. And then there's that swipe button in Instagram, which then posts it to Facebook. But in Facebook, I run messages uh, when people ask me about that. In My auto response has been set up into Facebook to let people know that we don't use Facebook, that I don't check the messages. If you want to get a hold of me, here's, here's the, best, right. the best contact. And what, what sort of post, live posts are you doing on Instagram? How, how does that work? Yeah, so um, as we were talking about before, uh, I have a whole weekly format that I try to stick to. So on Monday, I go live. And one of the things about live is just going live. Don't worry about looking good or bad or stupid or anything. Just go live and you'll get better at it really quick. Going live shows authenticity. So on Monday, I go live. I show my customers and I tell my customers what's coming up for the week, um, what they can expect, specials and everything else. Then save it through the Instagram system, make it into an IGTV, make it into a post. And you'll start using the software as they want you to use it. And then they'll start promoting you more. Um, on Wednesdays, I do another little like a topic talk on some of the food that I do. And I and then on Fridays, I'll do a follow up, a good morning follow up or something as well. We um, I over post. I go against a lot of recommendations. I can post 20, 30 times a day, uh, two live videos, um, some thought and feeling that I thought I just had. I'll just stick it up there. And, you know, you get a thousand, a thousand to fifteen hundred views per per video um, and, you know, quite a few hundred interactions with, with photos nice. and so on like that. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. And if anyone's got some more questions for Kit on how he's using social media, um, I've got quite a few. Just drop them into the chat because I'm going to move on now. But sure. that's uh, fascinating. 10,500 uh, followers on Instagram is nothing to be sneezed at. And just the one, the last uh, thing, uh, Kit has got the uh, French nuclear submarine in his uh, shed. Oh, it's actually, no, his <laughs> giant smoker. <laughs> yeah, so on, of course, on the left there, that's a three and a half ton, uh, 7.5 metre offset smoker. Um, it is. Uh, it could cook. Uh, I think probably about three cows, maybe, uh, maybe two cows or so. And on the right there, that's um, uh, when you're looking. When, if you're not doing, if you've got time in your cafe, um, you know, because of all these lockdowns and everything else, um, start trying to figure out other stuff you can do that you do every day that you can show other people how to do it. So I opened a school. Um, at the start of lockdown, before we weren't allowed to travel anywhere, I opened a smoking school. Uh, so I teach 12 people, um, you know, people, education's quite profitable. Um, you know, it's a three people per smoker, $320 per person times 12 people times, you know, once a month, twice a month. Um, and they all share, you know, the cold meats, which I buy in from my suppliers. And then you can upsell everything in your shop. And so if you're, if you're doing pasta, if you're an Italian, if you're, uh, if you're, if you're doing whatever, just, Tell, offer your customers offer your a school, and run a school as well <laughs> run your schools do it via zoom do whatever like you've got all nice. this time now you might as well start doing something a little bit different until Great. the world opens up again okay well lots of questions for kit drop them into the chat there he's going to answer them for us and i'm going to jump on now to talk to reno about all aboard seafoods in perth um so here's the counter i'm just going to give you a little uh, picture so it's kind of it's clean it's fresh it's traditional because the product is you know as we know it and the sort of food that we trust um, I've got a few uh, 
screenshots from his website with seafood. Reno, tell us about how long you've been there. What's the range of the menu? How's the menu changed in the last few years? A few things like that. Oh, look, we, we, uh, we've been here about 22 years altogether. Um, Mum and Dad opened under a franchise back in 99 when I was in school. And, and then when, we, when I finished school, I came in and we set up our own brand and, and we've sort of gone gang, gangbusters from there, which has been really good. Mm -hmm. um, we focus on fish and chips and burgers, um, quality, and, and, and we cook everything to order. We don't do any pre-cooking. Um, so it's not like sitting in a Bay Marie. Um, yeah, so, you know, we target more our families and, uh, you know, the old school fish and chips, as well as a bit of a modern upmarket um, spin on it as well. So, uh -huh. Well, um, I'm looking at, just, at the range of um, fish you've got there too. This is, uh, maybe you do sell, um, uh, you know, the, the traditional fish and chips, but you've got barramundi, you've got cod, you've got King George Whiting and things like that. It's a yeah. bit of a variety, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, like we sell... Yeah, and obviously varies on quality and price point. So you've got a bit for everything, um, different tastes, you know, um, which is which is quite good. And and trying to, we're always looking at something different. You know, we brought the North Atlantic cod in to bring in a bit more of the old school traditional English fish and chips. We even make our own mushy peas now, so um, which is really cool. Um, Earth has a lot of English people living there, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and we've even started doing vegan fish and chips, which okay. is something completely different. Um, which, um, yeah, you know, obviously. I didn't. Know, I, mean, I didn't ask Kit about that. We, <laughs> I didn't give him a hard time. <laughs> I missed that. Sorry. No. It's cold um, swap. <laughs> but um, our look, our menu is quite big. Um, in since COVID. We've had to look at how we can simplify and, and rein it in a little bit. Um, we've always had the approach of, you know, sort of catering for every member of the family. Um, that way, you know, you, you sort of got a bit of something for everyone, no uh -huh. matter what their taste. So what, what's your pricing like compared to other fish and chip shops uh, in, well, um, fish and chips are shops, uh, uh, traditional ones are not too common these days, but, you know, around you know in perth are you on the high end or do you keep your no, prices we're probably cheap? we're probably a bit more than than your average corner shop um but fish and chips has always been like a secondary income you know the little corner mm -hmm. you know old shop that never sort of doesn't you know doesn't keep it up to up to standard or whatever whereas for us it's always been full time right um and yeah so so, Reno, tell us about fryers and cooking oil, because the price of cooking oil has soared in the last 12 months. You're, that's kind of make or break oh. for you. You've got what, what brand of fryers are there? Um, why do you go with that brand? You know, what's your, what is your routine for oil filtering? Yep. What have you, you know, anything you've changed or improved in the last little while? Look, the, the price of cooking oil has gone up 25%, I think, on average. Ours went from, we were using a Sonola oil, which went from $77 to 125 bucks a year, over, overnight. Um, so obviously we had to pivot and look at alternatives. Um, we filter our oil daily. Um, you got automatic my, filtering or do you do yeah, it to yeah, drain? Yeah, we were talking about it earlier. We, we have an independent unit. So you empty your tank, your, your oil tank, and you use it. It's got a hose on it so you can wash it all down, get all your finer stuff out. And then we've got a separate net again, which has a second point of filtration to get all your finer crumbs mm -hmm. out of it. And it gives you the longer shelf life. Um, we actually throw out about 60 litres a week. Um, and we now, now with the oil change, because obviously we've had to go to another product, which isn't as good as what we used to use. But all it means, it just needs to be looked after. Mm -hmm. And the more the more frequent you filter it the more you look after it and even during service like making sure the staff skimming the oil constantly non-stop as they're using it and moving products around right. it really preserves the shelf life of it um, what what brand of fryer are you using uh, i use waldorf um mm -hmm. is that one you've always used or yeah, is that one yeah, you changed yeah. to? I, i've okay. always used them and i actually have two different models so so when we put our fish in so our the way our our 
our system works is chips start at one end of the chain and fish starts at the other end and they meet mm -hmm. in the middle. Um, we use a high performance unit for the for the chip fryers, which um, just has a turbo, so it's quick, very quick recovery. So as fast as you're pumping your, you know, your frozen chips, in, right. it, it recovers quicker. Um, and then we have two non non um, HBO units as well, and we've got a few, um, a handful of Roban your bench top for just your smaller things that okay, you know, you know that um, don't need the 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 unit, the bigger units. The turbo, yeah. Tell yeah, us about yeah. um, packaging because that's one of those costs that people kind of think isn't doesn't exist, but it's actually pretty pricey for every uh, box of food that goes out. Yeah, what what yeah. where do you you source locally? Do you import or what, um, should, what would you recommend to people who are listening or who are starting up to? Look, branded packaging isn't out of the ballpark for any size business. Um, it's just about like what you use. We went through a local packaging company and, and they facilitated the, you know, the, the custom print job. Um, and, yeah, and we, we made the transition from paper probably about 10 years ago, the old butcher's paper. Yes, it was a significant price jump, but there are, out, there are ways to offset that. For example, in a box, you can only fit so much. Mm -hmm. Whereas in butcher's paper, you know, that lousy... 100 grams of chips, you know, at the end of the year, you could be talking tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Um, so that was that was the biggest, you know, advantage of making that move. And it also enabled us to, to look at different menu items that you can't put in paper. Um, you know, for example, like you're looking at now, like salad options mm -hmm. and different combinations. It allows us the opportunity to put different packs together. Yeah. Nice, um, nice. And I think the important thing with the packaging too is to look at something that's not completely um, outrageous or, you know, like um, when I say outrageous, I mean um, unique. Like the, the, the boxes that we use are actually available in a generic print. Right, format. okay. So they're not already specially made. designed to your yeah. shape. So or they're, anything. they're yeah. already being made. They're already uh -huh. in production. So the custom print actually isn't as expensive as what it could be if we were designing our own. Yeah, and Joe Zachary's got a question in the chat. You might like to answer in in a minute once we finish talking about the the packaging or your supplier, yep. etc. Now, I'm very interested in the, your drive through. That's yep. something we usually think, you know, you've got to be a big uh, chain to do this, but you've been doing this for a few years as well. Yeah. Um, so what I give my order here on the little blue box, is that the idea? Yep, yep. It and works then, the exact same as your major fast food outlets. Mm -hmm. um, when we opened the store um, back in the day, uh, between us and the restaurant next door, um, parking was always a bit of an issue. Yep. So it was, it was um, you know, a quick thing to implement a drive-through system. What you're looking at now is a real um, simplified version of it. We just recently upgraded it and uh, put some um, bigger menu frames in so we can, you know, got more area to advertise. Right. If you could develop, if, if you started your drive-through from scratch, would you change anything or add anything to it to make it more efficient? Um. Possibly, you know, like we've only got one order spot and one window on the mm -hmm. side of the building. You know, we, you know, if we had more um, space there, you know, like look at McDonald's and now they're doing dual lane, which we don't yep. have the option to do. Sure. We, don't okay. have the, we don't have the space. And also the cost as well, like yeah. for us, okay. for a smaller operator. Nikki, you uh, see a few um, operators putting in you know kind of informal yeah. drive through or you know a lot of expansion with takeaway what sort of equipment are you seeing people using or what are you how are they doing it um yeah i think probably one of the most interesting that i saw was out at uh Narromine, the royal hotel because obviously covid hit but they needed to turn over some money so they turned the car park into a drive through so it circles around the pub itself and they in, uh, put in some pizza ovens uh, conveyor pizza ovens so fast turnover easy to prepare doesn't have to have extremely high qualified chefs to serve up the food because again he told me that in our mind there's not a lot of resources out there to 
have qualified chefs. So putting in the pizza oven, turning the car park into a drive through so no one had to actually come into the business um, mm. helps them survive through this time. Interesting. Uh, you know, when everyone registered for the webinar today, one of the questions was, what you, you know, has anyone got plans for drive through and uh, about 20% of people said they're either doing it or got plans. So yeah, interesting. Yeah. Lots of uh, opportunities there, I think. Just just on that note, Ken, the, mm. the important thing too, when you're implementing a drive through, like for us, we actually don't have the majority of our menu on it. We only display right. stuff that's uh -huh. quick, simple um, and popular. And okay. so if you want the full menu, um, it's no different to even like Uber. You come in store, and you come inside. Right. Okay. Um, and that enables us to, especially for us, because we cook everything to order, um, to pump the cars through quick, nice and quick. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Now, um, Reno, really interested to talk to you about Uber Eats. Um, you use all the services, as I understand, and uh, we got your feedback before about, um, you know, you do a special pricing on the different apps uh yeah well we're on all the platforms um so, so and where, which ones do you get the most volume for uber without uber. without a doubt uber. so what you got Nothing menu log door dash delivery as well yeah yeah okay delivery yeah, that's, that's the same here first. as well yeah okay so um, the reason I put a Coca-Cola bottle there is I'm not a big Coke drinker myself, but Reno, when we were talking before, you gave me some fascinating information about how Coke redid your Uber uh, um, Uber Eats menu. Do you want to tell us about what the results were with that? Yeah, well, the Coke approached me a, a few weeks ago about joining a, a growth partnership program. And so basically what they do is they go into our Uber account and optimize it. So where we can add on a drink as an upsell um, and they, they do all the work for you. They, do the, they help you with pricing. They help you put photos up. And interestingly enough, in the last two weeks, um, our drink sales have dramatically increased and a shift like I used to focus on cans because you could obviously sell them at a price point where you could still make your margin on it. And interestingly enough, like when we did the analysis, if you sell a 600 mil for the right, right price, yes, your percentages are less, but the actual dollar figure at the bottom of it is, is more. Um, and we've noticed a significant change where just simply adding a photo of a drink, which I didn't think would make a huge difference, mm -hmm. but it has. It has mm -hmm. it's dramatically changed it. Um, so, and then you look at your average price per, per order. Um, yeah. And, and apparently they're willing to um, expand that into the other platforms as well, not okay. just Uber. Interesting. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Because uh -huh. um, see what you both you guys are saying is, you know, it's uh, in 2020, there was a lot of Uber hate and, you know, every, well, they are what they are, aren't they? They take your data and they take 30 or 35 percent, whatever. Yeah. But it's from the what you guys are saying and other feedback on the chat as well. People are now ready and um, confident to surcharge. But also, yeah. like you're saying, Reno, let's work um, with some other partners and see how we can optimize it. Because that sort of menu engineering that you're talking about, we're not necessarily experts at that, or you know, that's that's their job, isn't it? They want to sell more Coke, of course. But your um, ticket sale, total ticket spend for each uh, order is going up quite a bit as well. Yeah, that's right. And, and at the end of the day, why not make them work for it? Yeah. If it doesn't yeah. work and I don't sell the extra drinks, mm. they're not getting anything in return for it. Mm. And well, Andy's asking you, is do they... have an outlaid, you know? Yeah. Does, does uh, Coke charge for this service? No, no, no. no. Okay. It was complete. It's all part of the service uh -huh. because at the end of the day, they want to see like yeah. we're targeting like forty percent growth on our on our Coke account. That's what. Uh, I and you know, I think it's like we've you've seen the, the Coke guy. You know, they come in with the heavy duty 
PC and they stand at your, at your fridge and, you know, they just seem like a bit of a nuisance trying to sell you stuff you don't want usually. But if we actually engage them, the same as the Uber account manager, <laughs> there's actually probably got good stuff if we're, yeah. uh, you know, ready to just be a little bit patient with them. So, yeah, yeah nice and feedback. I, and I take the same approach even with, like, other partners, you know, with, with all sales reps. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, for me to make money, they have to make money. Mm. And, and I think if you take that approach with everybody and work together, um, in the end, that's when you achieve the best results. Mm. And not only that, but they've got, they may have different resources. They may have, they may have more time mm. to focus on the things that you don't. Yeah. And they're also seeing Kid, what's going Kid, on any out comments there. On, uh, on this? Well, what, what other partnerships have you looked at with any other suppliers yeah no me, me personally no i don't um yeah no i don't have partnership with anyone i don't have any sure. partners okay. yeah i just I, I run a lot yeah without that but shit if if i got to the point where coke could um would, would offer me something um or oh, well, work on something like that you, you, you two can't. guys if, might have to chat have a chat after yeah. <laughs> I, well, I don't sell enough I, I wouldn't sell enough for them to get involved and uh, i get i wonder i wonder i wonder <laughs> so, lawrence I any comments from you about you know partnerships or you know optimizing the apps like this and making them into more powerful selling tools I hadn't actually heard of the the Coke partnership concept. That's that's really cool, actually. But it mm. makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because mm. you know, generally they're pretty good at understanding the upsell, and they know that their brand sells. Right? They so know customers go, too. Yeah, yeah, and they do great photography. <laughs> can, can I ask Lawrence a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Lawrence, um, with with you, you've got you've got a great overview of all the platforms. Uber Eats, um, we, we, we tried DoorDash and we tried uh, MenuLog or MenuLog and Deliveroo and I closed them down pretty quickly. They didn't work for us a few years ago, not now, but a few years ago. So we stuck with Uber. Uh, Reno just said um, Uber is, you know, he's by far the, the biggest um, seller of his, his delivery partner as well. Um, when you look across all of the platforms, where are you seeing, how are you seeing, where are you seeing them all sit? Um, Uber for us, uh, I don't know if your customers are, are talking to you as well with the integration, Uber for us has now got huge increases and in delivery delays. I see the Uber marketing yeah. just even this week was we're allowing your customers now to change midway. You know, if they can't be delivered, they can quickly change to pick up. Um, how, how are you seeing it as somebody that integrates to, to both all the big guys, the little guys, um, and yeah, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so the, it, it is interesting. The, the, in terms of volume, I think it's different by, by state and even region and locality and everything. It can change like how powerful, say, Deliveroo is versus somebody else. But if I said generally speaking, um, what we see is Uber is the dominator by far, usually by a factor of maybe three to eight times over the next guy down you know what i mean depending who the number two is and then in, depending on the area the number two will often be doordash we i find it interesting a lot of people go oh, i don't know don't use doordash but they seem to have pretty good volume so okay. if it was my business i'd go i think i should check out doordash um deliveroo seems to be quite a niche it's either dead or okay in some okay. areas again depending yeah. where you are almost I mean, it could have to do with localities and how many maybe people deliver on bikes versus cars or all sorts of things, right? So for different reasons. Yep. Um, and Menulog, I think it's just been around for a long time, but again, again, very regional. Cause so I had a big conversation with a, a large customer and they said that in, um, in Queensland, they have lots of problems with Menulog in terms of the drivers showing up or saying, yeah, I'll be there in literally 170 minutes. You know, I'll be there in three yeah, hours. Yeah. <laughs> this sort of stuff where you just go <laughs> on. <laughs> We're finding the exact same. Yeah. Well, they got to fly in, did they? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, where did the guy start from? Anyway, imagine yeah. just being the guy and the driver going, yeah, I could be there in three hours. I now, look, um, anyway, so we've got something to do. We've got, uh, we've got one minute. I think we actually need another good half an hour with this, but we've got exactly yeah, one for minute me. to go. So um, I'm just going to wrap up uh, quickly. If, if We've got a few questions in the chat there as well. Um, I'm going to kind of end the webinar, but not kind of close us down completely. We'll drop a few answers into that as well. But just like to quickly um, thank our guests, uh, Lawrence, for your uh, helicopter view. Um, you know this industry inside out, and it's just your insights have been very useful. 
Reno, thanks for uh, your very practical observations. You're kind of doing it, been doing it for such a long time and uh, always ahead of the curve with technology and kit, you know, your fresh energy. And um, yeah, we, I think everyone is really admiring your, well, you sort of made it sound like a two day work week. It sounds like it's a little bit more than that. <laughs> no, it's not. I lie. <laughs> Especially as you're kind of hanging out. It's a small media. business. It's 24 seven. Yeah, but it works. Anyway, and uh, thanks to um, Nikki Smith, who's my colleague as well at Silver Chef, and uh, <laughs> reach out to there. <laughs> yeah, the Sven is our other business development manager who was meant to be on today, but uh, couldn't make it. Anyway, um, yeah, and also don't forget, uh, you know, jump on our social media as well. Um, but um, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Um, keep your eye out for the next webinar, and um, yeah, great content today. Really excellent thanks for stuff. Having us. Thank you. Thanks for having thanks us. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone. That was um, that was really awesome. Yeah, really. I'm, I'm just answering questions still in the background. Yeah, good. Okay. Well, that, what I usually do is uh, at this stage I kind of turn the turn the slides off, but we can just have another couple of minutes to uh, take a question. Do you take your own there, pictures but... on hmm? your? I was just wondering, Kit, do you take your own pictures on Instagram? Or... Yeah, the 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 really really high quality ones are done by a customer. Um, and as I said, I'm for tight, a free so burger. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't spend money on anything. If I can avoid it, I try and do everything myself. Uh, but everything else is pretty much taken on an iPhone with us, with me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, Reno, you got a photo shoot done recently, I think, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I take advantage of um, the photo shoots offered by the delivery partners. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Right. I, I've got menu log chasing me right now, and mm -hmm. I just had one six months ago, and it's just like, so you just use it and take advantage. Yeah. And then um, I met a really good photographer, a husband and wife team, and uh, I got their details, and I just said to them, like, when you're in the area doing, for, and you've got a bit of space to fill in between, um, let me know, and we just, and I just slip them some cash, and we, uh, and yeah, they come out and take 10 photos at a time, sort of thing. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Mm. Just trying to take advantage of whatever opportunity you can. Yeah, nice. Cool. Well, I think the questions are going to keep coming, and I'm going to su suggest everyone jumps over and connects with you guys either on LinkedIn or directly through um, Instagram. There's a good messaging there as well. But um, yeah, you're really generous with your information. It was. Um, Fantastic. From what you guys said too, I got to say, photos of your food has got to be one of the most important, mm. simple things ever, right? Like mm. nothing sells better than a really good photo. And in the new world, like those things start to go on your website, on your mm. Insta, on your Facebook, even even potentially at table ordering, all sorts of stuff. Like you can just use those photos so many times. Mm. Mm. And, and I think one of the keys too is, you know, have a shot list. Here's the list of shots I want. You know, mm. I mean, they'll they'll have their list of things, but the, while the photographer's snapping, and uh, I saw a, a interesting comment the other day about you know food, uh, but hands holding food is more appetizing sometimes than you know like a bowl full of something held by hands than just the bowl of food. Yes. So take both because then you've got two different photos. Uh, and another one is, you know, play with the food. So it's like one of the noodles being picked up with the chopsticks or the um, melted cheese dripping off it or something like that. Anyway, that's another webinar, it's, I think. <laughs> I've actually got a friend who's a food stylist and she uh -huh. does horrible, horrible but amazing things with food, you know, to make it. She did a lot of stuff in FMCG. So yeah. a lot of like stuff that you see on the front of like a, a you know a kilo of sugar you know those yeah, sorts uh -huh. of pictures yeah and the stuff that she puts into food is just evil yeah because it's like gluey it's not edible right yeah, but it yeah. looks yeah. like so amazing yeah, yeah <laughs> I reckon there's, there's, there's definitely something to that it's definitely yeah it's, it's not a it's not a misrepresentation it just looks perfect you know yeah for a long time so they can take yeah. photos so important it's worthwhile thanks my friends oh, really appreciate you all your thanks time. a lot nice, nice to meet you, you guys thank you Cheers. See you later. Bye. Awesome. Bye.